Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum. Our guest in this segment is Pedro Mora, and we're going to be talking about democracy. Uh, Pedro is the producer and often the host of an excellent program, also on Shaw Cable, um, called uh, Pacific.ca. Called Pacific.ca. I'm going to get shot for keeping on forgetting this name. That's all right. Um, it's a difficult name to spell. Because <laughs> it's P A S I F I K. P A S I F I K dot C A. And they have had on some of the most important programs I've ever seen on television. If you go to the website, you can watch them. Pedro is also the author, under the pen name of Yon Del Sol, of a book called Perpetual Direct Democracy, uh, widely available. On Amazon.com. So we're going to be talking about democracy. And Pedro, you wanted to start off by talking about representative democracy, which is what we now have. That's right. Representative democracy is a very old system. Uh, we have uh, old cars, uh, 20 years old, and we, uh, we're amazed to see them as a vintage cars. And we have old houses of uh, 60, 80, 100 years old, and we admire those old, old buildings. Now we have a political system that is 146 years old, which is celebrated 146th birthday a couple of days ago in Canada. Now, when you have a system, a political system that has gone for so long without major structural changes, uh, something is wrong with it. Uh, because things evolve, technology evolves, thinking of people evolves, and uh, we are still holding on this representative democracy which was handed down by the kings of England and, and, and Sweden in the 1800s somewhere. And uh, they uh, decided to make uh, a little bit of, give some participation to their subjects. And they said, uh, okay, we'll, we'll have some elected uh, uh, representatives. And uh, the final word is, of course, the stamp, the seal still comes from the king, but uh, uh, people can elect as representatives and, and have representative democracy. So representative democracy is considered as the best type of democracy in Western countries that money can buy. And what I'm here to say is that there is an alternative, that there is something called direct democracy, which is uh, much uh, superior, much more developed than representative democracy. Now, to me, the problem with representative democracy, one of the problems is that the people we elect don't really even bother to represent us. Mm -hmm. So. That, I mean, is, is a fundamental flaw, even above the things you've talked about. So we, we want to move towards direct democracy. Yeah. Uh, the problem also with representative democracy, uh, Jack, is that uh, it empowers, it, it concentrates power in individuals, in a few individuals, and therefore they become subject to, prone to corruption. And that's what you're saying, they don't represent us. Yeah, because the, the people that pay for their campaigns, usually corporations, will have a say on whatever the, the elected uh, candidate has, uh, has received. So uh, empowering, concentrating power in a few candidates is actually a disfavor to democracy. Democracy should be for everyone, not just for a few elected politicians. And we have this mentality of following the leaders, following the party line, following, well, used to be following what the kings or the dictators say by coercive uh, means. And we have to come out of that and realize that uh, we are equals, that uh, representative democracy is uh, simply a, a, a small concession by monarchies, but it's not by all means the, the ultimate type of democracy that direct democracy should be aspired to. Now you said, what is perpetual direct democracy, which is the subject of this little book? Perpetual direct democracy, as uh, the name uh, says, is perpetual is an ongoing. And that comes from perpetual uh, accounting. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember when, uh, when accounting and, and factories and stores was made by Everybody locking themselves in on a Saturday and counting every donut, every, every screw, every, every desk, every typewriter. And uh, that was the accounting, inventory day, they call it. And uh, then computers came. And they 
Brad perpetual inventory with computers because every time you sell something it's registered and the inventory is done on the spot. So democracy has the possibility with computers of doing exactly the same thing, a perpetual accounting of who wants to uh, bridge here, who wants to increase taxes over here, who wants to uh, uh, part, uh, recall some uh, embassy from some country and why. That should be a uh, decision by the people all the time and as in an ongoing basis, not so just once every four years. Can we, can we look at a specific example of, of some kind and... Uh, of direct democracy? Yeah. Well, in, uh, in Switzerland, they have more uh, referendums than here. So uh, I would say they, have, uh, they are in the, in the road to perpetual direct democracy. They're not quite there but they have a little more than what we have here. Here we have referendums, I don't know, once every couple of years, maybe once in four years or something, we had referendums when uh, uh, Quebec wanted to separate, we had referendums when... Uh, the HST. HST was a good referendum, and uh, people proved politicians to be wrong, to be... So in, in the previous segment, we were talking about CETA, this new trade deal that Mr. Harper wants to put us into. So under perpetual direct democracy, the question would be up there. Uh, the question, do, do you as a citizen want this to yes. move ahead? And, and the negotiations, because the negotiations are being made in secret, behind closed doors. Only business people and uh, negotiators know exactly what they are negotiating, but not even politicians. If you go to the mayor of uh, Victoria and ask him, do you know what is being negotiated? He doesn't know because he is not part of that committee. So uh, members of, of parliament, members of the legislative assembly, councillors, politicians are not participants to this negotiation. Never mind people like you and me. So it, it is, uh, there are, there are uh, negotiations being behind people's uh, consent behind people don't know what's going on and obviously direct democracy would be put it to a referendum put all the information out there and the computers that we have and libraries and uh, uh, websites have people understand what the issue is and why should we do whatever they want to do and then have a referendum where people very well informed vote on it but and your idea of the referendum would be that it's kind of ongoing it's not a simple referendum on one date, That's but right. I mean, public opinion changes. Yes. And so the CETA question would be up there and there would be an ongoing count of how the people of Canada feel about it. Yes. And if Canadians are saying absolutely no, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. the government would simply stop negotiating it on. Sure. Sure. Uh, the, the, the idea of an ongoing uh, process is because to me democracy is subject to understanding things. And today you might sell me uh, uh, a bid, uh, uh, an idea that is not quite good, but I may misunderstand it and vote in favor of it. Six months down the road, I may see the truth and say, no, in fact, I want to reverse it. So. Direct democracy means that you have the right to change your mind or the right to change your vote when you change your mind. So we could have a free trade agreement for a year and a year later people might say, we have to rescind it. We have this to abolish it. This isn't working for us. We can see it's not working for That's us. That's right. And most trade deals uh, do have a time limit. NAFTA, I think, you can get out of it in six months. Six months. Although yeah. the new deals that Mr. Harper is, going, is signing, the FIPA deals, mm -hmm. um, are for 30 years. So yeah. they're locking us into things. Yeah. But those are just the results of yes. the lack of democracy. You know, the, the fact that uh, most people want 100% paid Medicare and we're eroding our funding for Medicare and we're charging fees here and fees there. Uh, the fact that we're losing our 100% uh, paid by the taxes education system at university level uh, is also increasing their fees. And most people don't want it, but governments think that that's the way to go because governments think that the money that is supporting those services come from their pockets. And they say, oh, we don't have enough money to support all these things. So it is, 
it, it is uh, uh, almost like uh, uh, what was this uh, movie where uh, Dorothy, I think, was uh, fell in the hole and. Oh. Uh, uh, what was the name of the it? Wizard of Oz. The, 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 no, Alice no. in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, where things are upside down, and you say, "Why is this happening?" Because the politicians have the ultimate power to do whatever they want, and we can just scratch our heads and go on the street and scream and protest and so, say this is wrong. So, for example, the question could be: Would you like to raise taxes on the, let's say, the one percent, the oil companies and the banks? and the logging companies mm -hmm. and use that to reduce university tuition or to improve our health care system. That would be up there and, and what people That's wanted right. is what we'd get. If people had the choice, people would definitely want things to be different than what right now the government is doing. But we don't have the power because on elections day what we're doing is giving them full power with our vote. So we have a five-minute democracy. It's when we select somebody. After that we have no democracy. We're under the illusion that we're a democratic country, but we are not. We are we're just uh, under a temporary dictatorship by the few politicians. So the next question is, what do we need to do? And uh, we uh -huh. seem to need an evolution. <sighs> what do we need to do? Uh, Yes, I, I wanted to talk a little bit why this change has not happened. Why this change has not happened? Because our, uh, we have somebody explained to me, we have two parts of the brain, the reptilian brain and also the, the front part of the brain, which is the logical, the analysis. And the reptilian brain is, is the feelings, feelings of comfort, feelings of uh, well-being. And when we have a system that is more or less working for most Canadians, then we tend to think that we don't need a change. Uh, intellectually, we can understand that there's a few things wrong, right? Like we were talking about free trade, education, health care, all those services. But emotionally, we say, but it, it's all right, it's working. So we don't want to lose what we have. So emotionally, we keep drifting by inertia on the system that we have because it's too difficult to make changes or we think that it's too difficult to make changes. So. The, the logical part of the brain that has facts gets overruled by the emotional well-being. We become smug and comfortable. And, uh, and that is why we, we're stuck where we are. And perhaps we'll continue to be stuck for many years. Maybe a, a real change, a real democratic change might not happen in our lifetime. But we, we have to continue preaching it and saying there is an alternative. Now, uh, why that's one of the, the, the reasons why we are where we are. Now you say, what do we need to do? And I guess there are many ways to, to solve that problem. What, there are many ways, that, many things that we, we, we could do. Uh, but I think we have to focus on uh, structural changes, not just on outcomes and say we want to uh, raise salaries, which to me is a, is a consequence of people deciding. If people don't have the power to, to make those decisions, how, how much a salary should be, then, um, which is unions usually, uh, then just fighting for higher wages is fighting fires here and there and there. We have to go to the root cause of why things don't happen the way is beneficial for the people. And when we look at it, we see that it doesn't happen because we don't have the power to make those changes, because we have given our power to politicians. And politicians are vulnerable to corruption. So I agree with you, I agree with you 100%. And when you say, when you're talking about raising salaries, I think you're talking more about just making it so that everybody is, has at, le at least enough money to get by in this life. Sure, and, and that's debatable. I mean, raising salaries or giving more services uh, is the same thing. I mean, if people have more services, it's equivalent to raising salaries. So if, if the government collected more taxes like they do in Northern Europe and gave more, more services, then salaries would be less relevant. Yes. 
But let's get back to your, your third question, which is we need a peaceful, cultural, political evolution to bring us to this kind of more perpetual direct democracy where what the public wants, the public is getting. That's right, because people usually hear revolution. We need a revolution, and they think, uh, oh, the Bolshevik revolution, or the Cuban revolution, or uh, some revolu armed revolution where people die. And we're talking of, uh, in Canada specifically, we don't need a violent revolution. We are not talking of uh, uh, people getting up in arms and going and burning the parliament building, like uh, Guy Fawkes did in England. Uh, I think what we need to do is peacefully uh, have an understanding of what we need. First we have to analyze what is that we need and in a peaceful manner discussing, uh, having forums, having referendums. Um, we need a new system rather than keep on protesting the old one. We have to keep a few things. So we need an evolution into a kind of what you say is perpetual direct democracy. That's right. I have different names for it, but, but I would certainly like to see much more democracy. Yeah. And we both want that. Yeah. So that's the evolution we have to move towards. Yeah, and uh, much more democracy is direct democracy because then all the decisions are made by referendum. All the decisions are made by the majority of the people, not just by few politicians, like in the city, uh, the CRD, you have 16 uh, directors, and they make the decisions for a million people. Uh, concentrating power again is dangerous, because yes. that power tends to corrupt. Uh, so we have to have that peaceful political evolution of a new system. Uh, we have to we have to review. And unfortunately, we've only got one minute left to tell people about that new system <laughs> okay. and counting. One minute and counting. How can we start a new political revolution? And that is by developing a constitution. If you look at all the uh, nations in the world that have uh, structural changes, like uh, Iceland, uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, they started with uh, uh, putting in a, in a, in a booklet a, co a constitution, a new constitution, because when we have the old constitution, uh, then we, we've, we, we're stopped, because, oh no, you can't do this because it's written in the constitution. But if and you we're going to have to wait till the next show to find out how to do that. And perpetual you do that by democracy. going here to, yeah. now, uh, to uh, perpetual direct democracy. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens <laughs> Forum about the most important topic, which is <laughs> more democracy. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me.